thing. <coughs> so I knocked together something about variable cells, not specifically about the setup that she's got for us to do. I'm mentioning this at the end. It's an idea about variable stars. <coughs> it's a great idea, it's a great project. Mind you, wait there. Um, it's a great idea to do variable stars simply because it's fairly easy to do. Not so easy as you might think, but the stars are generally available. I'm finding, I must admit, the few nights I've had a go at it recently, that either my eyes or the LED street lights are making it much more difficult than it used to be. It may be just age creeping up on me, but I used to do a few with Dave Gavin, of course, as our president, is a great uh, variable star man. And he does quite a lot, and very quickly too, he can do 20 or 30 in about 10 minutes. Whereas you've got to get to know them. So I said to, to June, did you pass it on to, pa to Pam? Pam? That we're doing something. That we're doing this? Aye, did yes, you pass it on? Oh, you okay. I said, I do something general about variable stuff, because they are interesting. It's never been my particular fascination, to be honest. I've done it because Dave was doing quite a number and he gave me a few interesting ones to do and I did them for a while but I hadn't done them for a long time. So let's <coughs> look at, at what variable stars are. And it's just, just working and work now. Oh yeah, whoa, yeah, whoa. Yeah, yeah. So I just put a few things together. You know that the stars form by contracting the interstellar molecular clouds and what happens is they tend to segment or fragment out depending on the density of the cloud to form a cluster. So you can see it in the Orion Nebula. And what happens, I say to the people on the Balkan, as you probably do yourself, the visitors here, you look at the Orion Nebula, you look at the Pleiades, and that's what's going to happen from the, the Orion Nebula. You've got this cluster of stars forming. And many of these stars, as you well know, and Bill's mentioned tonight, double star, form binary stars. But variables, variables can be, uh, well generally we're looking at single stars that are variable, they may be variable in binaries as well, but what kind of variable stars can we get? And this is the thing that interests me. You can look at any stars that vary, and they vary in brightness. But what fascinates me is what makes them vary. Now I can't remember when I look at a whole load of stars which ones vary in certain ways, but when I'm going to do variables, I like to know what I'm looking at. What's causing it to vary? That's what fascinates me. So there's the range of variable stars. They all vary. Intrinsic variable, variables which, which vary because of factors within the star themselves. And extrinsic variables which vary because of, in one case, groups in binaries. Or rotating variables which possibly have very large uh, spots on them which cause them to vary. So there are these, these two different categories. And Mainly, let's have a look at the first one. The first one is eclipsing binaries, because the first one that Pam chose was Algol, which is eclipsing binary. And I happen to have this diagram, so I'll show you what Algol is like. So Algol, uh, a fainter star, is orbiting a brighter star, and it's eclipsing it. And then the brighter star is going in front of the fainter star. So in this case, you've got two dips, but one dip is very marked. The dip where the, the faint star eclipses the bright star goes down deeply, and then when the bright star eclipses the fainter star, you get a little tiny blip. So there are actually two blips in this one, and they're very regular, as you can see, every two days, 20 hours and 49 minutes. This goes down for about 10 hours, I think it is. And John Goodrick, was the fellow who proposed the idea of how this actually happened. That it was a mechanism by one object orbiting another. He didn't know whether there were fainter or darker stars, or fainter or brighter stars, or, or um, something else. But he realised something was actually physically covering it. It had to do for such a precise variation. Another interesting one for, on that type is S.V. Cavalopardalis an algal type, and you'll see here the way they orbit, star 1 and star 2, you get primary and secondary eclipses, <coughs> which are almost the same. And that can happen. So remember, when you're doing variables which are eclipsing binaries, your pattern will always be a primary and a secondary dip. There will be quite significant differences between the dips of each particular star, depending on the brightness of the stars that are orbiting each other, and the amount of 
eclipsing that takes place between them. So each of the binaries which are orbiting will give you different light curves. So it's interesting, it's a good one to start on, fairly short period of time, so you don't have to wait for weeks or months for anything to happen. You can look at it, you can test your own skills by doing this one. You know what the brightness is going to be, you know what the maximum minimum brightness is going to be, they're always the same, and you can have a good, a good go yourself. The idea of having a group like Pam is talking about is a great idea for, for club members to get together and send the results in and hone how their skills develop. Because it's not the easiest thing to determine a brightness to within 0.1, 0.2 of a magnitude, which you will do with a bit of practice. So don't worry, if you, Spam will tell you, don't worry, don't hesitate to send in results that you have because you think they're not quite right. This will gradually come together. The more results that come in, the better. Because they'll be scattered, but you'll get a mean line through them. That's my little picture of a, a, a variable double star orbiting double line. That's just a bit of fun. Next lot we'll look at are pulsating stars. Now that's a great group. Cepheids, RR, Lyrae types, Taurus, low variables and so on, Mira types. There's a whole range of these things. But the, the, the fascinating ones are the Cepheids, which you will probably know that Henrietta Leavitt discovered them. And um, they are a, such an important group of variables, the Cepheids. And that's a group of ladies who were computers with Edward Pickering who looked over the plates and they found in their plates looking at the same areas of sky and certain stars varied. Some were just variables of various kinds but some were very specific. They had a particular pattern and that's the light curve of um, a sea field and the sea field expands and contracts. And here's what's so interesting about it. Knowing the mechanism is happening here, it expands and contracts so the brightest parts where it's biggest and the smallest dip in the, in the curve is when it's smallest. That expands and contracts like that. So it's brighter when it's bigger. It actually seems obvious, but you'll see it's not quite so obvious as it seems. But see if you do this. And the smaller they get, the, the light curve goes down. And the fascinating thing, which again you may know about this, well, first of all, where does this sit? The main sequence of the hirschsprung russell diagram, our sun's there. This is temperature, uh, temperature dependent from uh, high temperature down to low temperature, OBA, FKMN, uh, the famous group of, of coloured stars. And luminosities in comparison to our, to our sun, absolute luminosities, that is, absolute luminosities. And the, the classic CTAs sit above the main sequence up here, so they're pulsating. So it's nice to know this star is actually pulsating. We've got RR Lyrae stars, which are also pulsating stars, but they're much less uh, luminous than the Cepheids. Now, Cepheids you can use to determine long distance objects, objects far, far away. You can't do with RR Lyrae stars. They're pulsating but less luminous. The Cepheid stars, interestingly, the brighter they are, the longer the period of dimness to brightness goes. And the fainter they are, the shorter it is over several days, a day day scale. So they can, you can relate them to the time they take to go from highest point to lowest point. You can relate them to absolute luminosity, and by doing that, by comparison, you can measure distances. And standard candles used by Edwin Hubble to measure the distance of M31. <coughs> wonderful, wonderful stars. So if you look at any of the CTUs of your variables, just think how, how fascinating, how important they are. Cepheid variables, there are two types actually, in fact Hubble used a different type, a wrong type if you like, when he first estimated M31 and he estimated it being too close, the 900 million miles rather than 2. Point, uh, for light years, rather than 2.5 um, million light years. So luminosity 100 to 800 to 10,000 times that of the sun, see the great distances, so very useful to estimate distances in distant galaxies. Period of variability 1 to 50 days, absolute luminosity is related to the variable period. So, such handy things. <coughs> Next group we'll look at very briefly 
the RR Lyrae group. And they, they actually expand and contract, as I said before. As they expand and contract, they change their temperature. So you see when they're largest and red, that's the dip of the light curve. Where the Cepheids, when they were at the largest point, they were at the brightest, that was the peak of the, the curve. So see, our, our, our Lyrae are different to the, the Cepheids. So they change temperature. When they're hottest and blue, if you like, that's the peak of the, the um, level of the curve. So this gives you an idea of two different types of variables. Fascinating. You can go at the physics of this if you like. We're not going to do that tonight for the world these days. Now we've got the time. The RR Lyrae stars are older, low mass stars, spectral class A, luminosity much less as you see than the Cepheids. So that's why I've not seen from such great distances. 50 to 50, 40, 50 times that's the sun. See the globular clusters, very low PB but a day. And they can be used as standard candles for shorter distances, not for nearly the same distances as the. Um, as, as the, the Cepheids. The pulsate, um, the pulsate, the surface temperature changes gives much of the variability of temperature rather than the pure size. Eruptive cataclysmic stars, supernovae and novae, these can all be um, variable at times, some very, very bright at times. And this is how the 1A type supernova occurs. You've got a white dwarf in the middle and it sort of sucks off and pulls off by gravity from its companion star, grows and accretes mass and it becomes uh, 1.38 solar masses when it pops and becomes a, a nova. Now, I remember well, well, goes to minus 19.3 absolute magnitude, so there you go. It's got standard, it's a standard candle again. That's a good picture, isn't it? If you were there, the radiation would get you. <laughs> There's the curve. I remember very, very well, about 28th of August, 1975, I had a phone call from a very good president, from Dave Green, who said, Are you out, you're outside. Are you outside? No. Go outside now and have a look at Cygnus. Oh, okay. Why? Just go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I didn't have a mobile phone, you could take it outside you say, well, it's it's after all. <laughs> there you go. And sure enough, there was Cygnus with Deneb, the cross, you know, the cross of Cygnus, bang bang, Alberio, the cross. And there above it was a star, not quite as bright as Deneb, but near enough. That looked weird. Well, I just thought, my God, what's that? So I went again, picked up the phone, said, my God, Dave. I said, yeah, we just, I just heard about it. This is a light curve of a, it's a type 1A supernova, or nova should I say, not a supernova. It went up very steeply from about 20, <coughs> 26, 27th of August. It went up at 28th, it was getting towards its peak when Dave phoned me, and it dropped off over a few days, as you can see, and then gradually tailed off. That's a picture I took, <laughs> and that's it. I put a, a prism on the end of my camera, and that's a prism. Uh, mm -hmm spectrum of the actual is Deneb itself and here it is there. That was from my observers. Dave came around and we both messed about taking pictures and all sorts of things way back. All you need to observe, apart from your eyes, if you've got a good sight you might be able to do I can never do it on I need binoculars. 10 by 50s, 8 by 50s, that sort of binoculars fine. I know Dave's got a pair of goggles what 100 by, <laughs> I don't know, 100 by 25 or something. He uses, he uses different binoculars for different things. He does a lot, which are magnitude 9, magnitude even mm. 10. So you don't need that to start with. But well, as it says there, it's a good hint defocus slightly. It's much easier to estimate and judge the brightness of a star with another star if you defocus. Not too much. Just a little bit off. A pinpoint is very hard to estimate, believe me. And the other problem you'll come across, and you may well find out already if you've done this at all, many, if not most, apart from your eclipsing binaries, are red stars. Some are very red. And to compare them with other stars can be quite difficult mm -hmm. because the eyes are not sensitive to that. So you're comparing it with stars that have got an official value against your estimate, but it'll all be the same. So that's okay. 
It doesn't really matter. Just making an estimate of several ways, and numerous ways, and very complex methods. This is a simple idea of what you do. If you haven't done it, who's done this before? How many? Yes, one, two, three, yeah, you've done it. Okay. So what we're doing is looking at the, the star in question, the variable, and these dots represent the, the brightness of the star round about. And these figures are represent 6.4 magnitude, 5.1, 9.1, 6.1, and so on. So you can see, um, is the variable bright? Is the variable brighter or fainter than the 5.1 star? Well, what would you say? Is it brighter or fainter? Fainter. Yeah, it's fainter. Okay. How about uh, fainter than the 6.1 star? Yes. Is it fainter or brighter? Yeah, it's fainter. So that's, that's all you do. So you're getting an idea of where it is. It's variable um, brighter or fainter than the 6.4 star. Brighter. Brighter. Yeah. Okay, so we're getting an idea. See how it goes. That's how it goes. So now uh, you've got to interpolate it. The rest is going to be 6.2 or 3, isn't it? 6.2, 6.3. Between these two stars there. 6.2, Yeah. Okay, 6.2. Oh, whoa. Oh, go on. But it's that, it's that and that. It's going to be there. So you've got this, how you, this is basically how you do it. Now remember this star will vary considerably. This star might be that bright one day, or and then 3 or 4 or 5 mm -hmm. days are that bright. So in this case, You've really got to estimate it, and for B, for B, your estimate would be near 6.4, about that, about the same as that. For this one down here, when it's got fainter, your estimate's more like that one. So that's what you do. You look at the same standard star, run about it, you look at your variable, and you compare it as best you can. That's what you do to start with. Gradually you become more refined in doing this. Dividing out division between star brightness at 6.1 and 6.7, you kind of make it into divisions. <coughs> you've actually got to work at that. You've yeah, got it's to a lot work easier it. when you're comparing sizes like this. I think it's a lot easier when you're just comparing the size. <laughs> why, why, yeah. You see, this is, this is um, hey, what's this chap name in Edinburgh? He does it by, by taking photographs, yeah. and it's the software actually you can measure it very accurately. Yeah. Cheap. And I like this idea. No, I like this idea. This, this is more accurate to my scientific basis. <laughs> yeah, anyway, the whole thing. There's one I liked, TX Draconis. And a regular, unlike the regular variables, you wonder what's going on up there. What's happening to that star? Why is it varying very, very irregularly? Like the R Corona Borealis, which is a carbon star, and things like that. So that's one of my favourite ones that I've done before. And lastly, this is a list that uh, was set by Pam. And she said, she's got it in terms of time. <coughs> like uh, one week or medium or long term and, and, and an odd one, our Corona Borealis, which is an odd one. It's not one I would go for to start with, but she's put a nice little selection of five, not too many, so she can have a look at them reasonably without <coughs> spending hours and hours at them. The, Discuss with you, uh, I'll not discuss them all with you, Pam will do that later. Algol is uh, one of the very the eclipsing binaries. Beta Lyra, eclipsing binary as well, and then you've got two semi-regulars, and they're interesting because you don't quite know when they're going <coughs> to go down or up. And then this one, Arcora Borealis, and I wouldn't worry about that just now, it's kind of getting low in the sky, but it's way down just now. She I mean, you see them at age, it's 5.8 to 15. She said she'd find us some winter ones. Aye, that might be a good yeah. idea, because uh, these ones are going down now. Yeah. So that's the ones that she has. So I thought I'd just put this in uh, for Pam, mm -hmm. so that you get an idea of what she's trying to do. As I say, for me, the mechanisms that are working in the stars are the fascinating things. The variation is just a, a figure, but what's causing it? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Anyway, there you go. Okay. Pam will tell you about it later. <laughs> Any questions from the ah, Problems with the lights, they're not making a few. Any questions for Ken? On variable stars? No. Mm. Okay. I think it's unfortunate that the weather. The weather is. Uh, yeah, the yeah. 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 And, and finding time to add. Usually on a boat. Yeah, we keep it difficult on a boat.
not good, yeah. Um, maybe over the winter I'll try and do it. Yeah, if everybody's yeah. interested, anybody's interested in doing stuff like that, um, Sam will give you all of the uh, the chart things and the final.